So we're going back to Revelation. I took a little break from Revelation uh, last week. We talked about Sabbath, and we're back in the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 9, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. Um, the book of Revelation is a very difficult book to preach through, as I've mentioned pretty much every Sunday that I've done this. <laughs> And some passages are a bit more difficult than others, and this passage is a bit more difficult than others. Uh, so uh, just uh, pray for me as I speak that my words would be the Lord's words. Um, so we're going to read through the passage. There's a lot of strange things going on here. Uh, bear with me, and we'll read through it, and then we'll get back to it and work through it uh, piece by piece and talk about this and what it means. So uh, Revelation uh, chapter 9, I'm going to read the whole chapter. So. Here we go. And this is the fifth and sixth trumpet. Remember, we have seven angels blowing seven trumpets. Uh, there is, I, I handed out sheets, and you'll see the, the arrangement of the trumpets there if you want to take a look and sort of establish where we are. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, Smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. You recall in a previous chapter that the Lord sealed uh, those who were faithful to him with the seal on their forehead. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates, like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers, like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, destroyer. The first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. A little ray of sunshine for you this Sunday morning. A, a very hard passage, and, and really, in many ways, this chapter 9, well, you could make an argument, but in many ways, this is sort of the low point of the book of Revelation. Uh, this is the most dark, unrelentingly dark chapter and difficult to read through in many ways. So those of you who are visiting, welcome to my heart of sermon. <laughs> um, 
So, but there is good news here. You'll be glad to know. Otherwise, I just would have skipped this and gone on to something else entirely. Uh, but let's let's walk through it first and talk a little bit about uh, about this these images. First of all, I want to remind you, and if you want to go back to the beginning of the chapter, there, Elizabeth. Thank you. For one, let's remind ourselves of something that's very clear from the beginning of the book of Revelation, and I've talked about at some length already, but it's helpful to keep in mind that these are visions that symbolize things. These are visions that, sim so John is having these visions and recording them, and sometimes we're told explicitly what the visions symbolize, and sometimes we're left to guess, and sometimes we're told literally that we cannot know. <laughs> so this is, not a, this is not a story of something that's going to happen in the future where literal locusts with the, these fantastic uh, you know, heads and, and are going to come out of the earth. That is not, that's not the, the story of the book of Revelation. Not that amazing, incredible, and indeed terrible things aren't going to happen. They are, they symbolize real things, but they are symbols. So let's, let's remember that um, because there's, uh, uh, there's a, a, a kind of literalism can get us into danger with the book of Revelation. So uh, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth, and the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Okay, so right there, what are we talking about there? The abyss is essentially, uh, it, it would have its parallel in the Old Testament as Sheol, if you've ever heard of Sheol from the Old Testament, the place of the dead. It's a place of death and dying and darkness, so a, 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 a not fun place, and this uh, star is given the key to the shaft uh, of the abyss, to the place of, of death, basically. Um, so who gives this star this key? I'm going to take you back real quick here uh, to Revelation 1, uh, verse 18. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And who is that speaking? That's Jesus, I'll just tell you. That's Jesus speaking at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Jesus holds the key. To, so, so this star comes down and is given the key to this place of death and darkness, that smoke and, and fire are rising out of like a furnace. So this star, it becomes clear through the passage, is actually Satan. And I could go through a number of things to, to make that clear by pointing out to other passages, but I don't really have the time. Um, but this, this star that falls is an image of Satan. It is Satan. And later uh, in verse 11, uh, he's called a king. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, which is the same as the star, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek is Apollyon. And those are two words that mean destroyer or destruction. And Satan is the king of all things having to do with destruction and destroying. So this is Satan here who is given uh, this power. But we should never forget, Satan is given this. This is all an act of God in the end. Satan can only do, just like in the book of Job, where Satan has to go and, and request power from God to afflict Job and his family. Satan is not you know, some wild, uh, unfettered creature that does whatever he pleases. No one is like that in God's creation. Satan only gets his power from God. So he's given this ability to cause pain. And so the locusts come out, and part of how we know that this, I mean, there's many ways we know this is symbolism, but these locusts come out and they don't harm the grass or the earth or any plant or tree. That's exactly what locusts do. They destroy grass, earth, and plants and trees. But they are allowed to injure people. They're they not allowed to kill. Satan is given the power to cause anguish and injury. It almost sounds like a sickness, like an illness you know, like a, a disease that you, you have for five months, I think it says in the passage. And no, I'm not referencing COVID or anything like that. This is not, don't, don't put me there. Um, but that's what it sounds like to me, like a kind of illness or sickness, or who knows what of any kind, it goes out into the earth and people suffer. They suffer from it. Okay, where was I? Sun and sky were darkened by the smoke. The abyss out of the smoke, locusts came, they were told not to harm uh, anyone who had the seal of God on, on, on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture. And the agony was like that of a scorpion. 
and having spent some time in countries where there are scorpions, that is, a scorpion will strike you and you'll get very sick. You usually won't die from the scorpion sting, but you will get very, very sick. Um, during those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, I'm going to jump forward to the sixth angel, verse 13. If you give me that one there. So the sixth angel sounds his trumpet, and I heard a voice uh, coming from the four horns of the altar for God, said to the sixth angel, I had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And these are four angels who've mentioned early in Revelation who are told to wait and to not bring destruction yet. Well, now they're being released. Uh, interestingly, they're, they're bound at the great river Euphrates. Why is that significant? Uh, it, it's the Garden of Eden, the place where we uh, were initially in perfect harmony with God is at the Tigris and Euphrates and that uh, between those two rivers. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year. John is very specific in this, about this. This is not, again, this is not some chaotic event. There is a day, a month and a year where this is going to happen. This is planned, this is known. This is not something that's just randomly occurring. These are events that will come. There is an hour, there is a day, and a month, and a year. And these, this is not Satan's angels. These are not, these are not the locusts released by Satan. These are presumably godly creatures are released to kill a third of mankind. And John hears a number of mounted troops, twice 10,000 times 10,000, uh, which I believe is 200 million, if I remember correctly when I read it. So 200 million mounted troops going forward and a third of mankind dies. Okay, next uh, slide there. So, and you'll notice that, that their tails, unlike scorpions, which make you sick, were snakes having heads, which with they, and you're much more likely to die from a poisonous snake bite than from a scorpion bite. The rest of mankind were, who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor do they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Okay, so I want to move away from these images. So what we have here is basically Satan is released to cause pain and death, or pain and disease, torture. And then God releases these four angels at the Euphrates, um, and they kill a third of mankind. And that's essentially what's happened. Now, if you go to the next slide there, Elizabeth. What I want to look at are the people, us, who are experiencing this uh, before the final day of judgment. In verse 6, it says, during those days, people will seek death, but they won't find it. They'll long to die, but death will elude them. Now, I don't know if you have, I hope you have never been so sick that you've actually wanted to die. Is a terrible experience. I have once in my life, not that I was suicidal, but I remember I was so sick, I thought, if I died, I think I'd be okay, because <laughs> I am so ill. Um, so I'm familiar with that feeling, that emotion. And then it says in Revelation 9, verse 20, the rest who were not killed after the, after the four angels of the Euphrates did not repent. What makes this interesting to me, people still have at this point a chance to repent. People still have the option to come to the Lord. Death and disease have arrived in a way that the world has never seen, has not seen yet, and someday will see. And people still have the grace of God available to them. But what you're seeing as the book of Revelation unfolds is the hardening of the line between those who are saved and the unsaved. That line grows thicker and stronger and more clear. And God has already marked the, the, the people who are God friends or people who have given their life to Jesus. He's already marked them for salvation. And these are people who would rather seek death than seek Christ. And what the book of Revelation is in many ways is an intensification of the, the life that we are leading already. It's an intensification of what is already happening on the earth. And it's, it, it gets more and more intense, and it culminates in heaven coming to earth and hell being destroyed. But this is already a truth. 
that there are already people on the earth who would rather die than seek the Lord. They would rather lead lives of dissolution, lives of despair, lives of uh, whatever it may be, addiction, or uh, lives that just have themselves at the center than give their life to God. They would rather die than give their life to the Lord. One of the, one of the, I don't know how to put this. Let me turn to my friend here. One of the things this reminds me of, a phenomenon that this reminds me of in the world, are people, there are many different kinds of personalities and types of people in the world. And, and um, you know, this gets very, I don't want to oversimplify the human race, but it does seem to me that there are people, and some of these people are in the church, in, you know, on Sunday mornings worshiping, who are not really interested in the ultimate questions of life that they aren't really interested in reflecting deeply on why am I here? What purpose does my life serve? Is there life after death? And if so, what does that mean? And how should I be living? I am always astounded when I speak to someone and you know, or you know someone over the course of months or years and you get to know them and you find that those kinds of questions and those kinds of thoughts are really not a part of their makeup. It's, it's just not something that they, it's not a part of their life. And we are so good as a people, and I don't mean just America, although we do excel at this, but we're so good as humans at distracting ourselves and entertaining ourselves and, and finding diversions that pull away from this notion of, wait a minute, I exist. I exist and I'm here, and I'm not really sure even why I'm here, but there's all this stuff over here that these good things and terrible things and evil things. And there's all this stuff in front of me. And some people choose to go, no, it's not going to think about that. I'm just going to get on with my life. They would rather die than consider the implications. And, and this is different than people who seriously consider the implications of life and choose to reject Jesus. In a way, I sort of respect that more. I mean, depending on circumstances and all this sort of thing. But in a way, I respect that more than a person who's just like, I just don't think about stuff like that. You know, I just don't think about, I just get about in my life. I just do my job. I, you know, I have my, you know, I, I go to see the movies a lot or whatever. <laughs> now, I know that last week I preached on the Sabbath and I talked about the importance of going to see movies. But there's a, there is a difference, right? There's a difference of, of taking uh, time in your life and, and relaxing and, and, and immersing yourself in storytelling or what have you uh, to enjoy it because that's the fullness of life versus I, I don't want to think about the harder things. So I'm just going to constantly keep my, you know, my head on a swivel looking at things that distract me. Blaise Pascal uh, was someone who, uh, for lack of a better word, ranted about this uh, for, for some time. I, when was he, uh, Melody, do you know when he was? Was he 16th century? 16th century, something like that. I should have looked up his birthday. But anyway, he wrote sometime in the 16th, 17th century, maybe. <laughs> Um, but he was a famous, well, he was famous many things, a famous mathematician, but he also became a famous theologian. He died relatively young, uh, tragically, but one of the things he wrote about uh, was his, um, how it struck him how some people would rather die than think about things that are eternal. And so he wrote, he wrote this uh, passage in his, in his work, Penses, which was published after his death. The immortality of the soul is something of such vital importance to us, affecting us so deeply that one must have lost all feeling not to care about knowing the facts of the matter. I'm going to repeat that. The immortality of the soul is something of such vital importance to us, affecting us so deeply that one must have lost all feeling not to care about knowing the facts of the matter. All our actions and thoughts must follow such different paths according to whether there is hope of eternal blessing or not, that the only possible way of acting with sense and judgment is to decide our course in the light of this point, which ought to be our ultimate objective. Thus, our chief interest and chief duty is to seek enlightenment on this subject on which all our conduct depends. And that is why, amongst those who are not convinced, I make an absolute distinction 
between those who strive with all their might to learn and those who live without troubling themselves or thinking about it. So he's talking about the larger, like what's the meaning of life and people who struggle with that, you know, strive to find God in some capacity versus those who can't be bothered. And he goes on, he says, this negligence in a matter where they themselves, their eternity, their all are at stake, fills me with fills me more with irritation than pity. It astounds and appalls me, and it seems quite monstrous to me. Spoken like a true 17th century uh, philosopher. But I, I completely understand, I may not be as eloquent as Pascal, but I, I can relate to his emotions. I'm always appalled at that. Like these are the most important things. It, if it's true that there's an eternal life, you should really think about God. <laughs> Because that means everything you do matters. And, you know, it, it, it was uh, Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, from Bill Watterson, who said, what's more terrifying, that everything we do doesn't matter or everything we do does matter? And that is a very good way of putting it, right? And I think what we see up here in this passage, which I have not forgotten about, are the people who say it, it doesn't matter. There's no way I'm going to have anything to do with eternity. I'm not going to have anything to do with eternity. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to go on worshiping these fake idols, and I'm not going to repent. Why would I repent? There's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as evil. I'm not going to repent of, of, of murders or magic arts or sexual immorality or the things that I've stolen. And, of course, that list could go on for eternity. This is just a sampling of things that we do. Interestingly, you know, probably some 40, 50 years ago, if I was preaching on this, I would say, well, magic arts... I mean, that would be a symbol of something maybe in our society of like technology or what have you, right? Well, now it, magic arts are coming back. You know, they're kind of the new thing. I just, I read this morning, just to make sure I wasn't lying about this, but in 1990, in the United States of America, 8,000 people identified as Wiccan, as, as the you know, traditional witchcraft uh, uh, sect or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the best guesstimates of today, about 1.5 million. So it went from 8,000 to 1.5 million, and the number continues to grow. And I remember I was working at the public library, the Urbana Free Library in the early 90s. And I remember when we started to get these books, and I thought initially that they were, I thought they were meant to be humorous. They were Wiccan books, uh, books on spells and witchcraft and, and things. And I thought, I didn't realize, it took me a few weeks. So I was like, oh, okay, this is an actual thing. People are coming and checking these out for real, <laughs> you know? And now it's an established part of our community and whatnot. And I don't even mean to hold up Wiccans as somehow, I mean, again, at least they're pursuing a spiritual, they're looking for truth in some way, in some fashion. And I do respect that. I do. I mean, I, came, I went through a number of phases as a young man before I came to Christ. And I, you know, I considered Buddhism real seriously and it doesn't really matter. But I think that the pursuit of truth is always holy. The pursuit of truth is always holy. And I think because God is the source, the, the locus of, of truth. Anyway, so the rest of mankind, so people don't want to seek the Lord. They'd rather die. They seek death. They do not find it. They get sick. And then this terrible uh, apocalypse happens, and these, uh, these plagues come in and kill off uh, one-third of the human race. And you can imagine if this were to happen uh, in our lifetime, and I'm guessing it won't, but it could, if something like this were to happen in our lifetime, how do humans treat each other, generally speaking, when everything goes to pot, right? I mean, we saw even just maybe a, a little hint of it during COVID with, because of COVID, and we had a, a racial tensions in the country. I mean, there were terrible things happening, and we tend to get worse <laughs> with each other as opposed to better. And so you can just imagine, as God's judgment bears down, evil begets evil, right? And Satan is released to, to punish, and evil punishes evil. This is, it gets real interesting theologically, and if I had a lot of time, that'd be fun to talk about. But in a way, evil is its own punishment. Evil punishes evil. And it, and it squeezes tight like a fist throughout the book of Revelation, and the end is destroyed. But it's, it's, it's Satan punishing Satan in a way. Um, yeah, 
at any rate, what's not mentioned here or what's not spoken about until we get to the very end of, of the book is what the people with the, who are sealed by God are doing or thinking or saying during this time. A time of death, a time of destruction. Uh, people are engaged in murder, sexual immorality, uh, all, all manner of things. What are we doing? What are, what are we who are saved doing on earth at this time? I don't know. <laughs> but I like to think, what would we do? We'd still be reaching out to people, wouldn't we? At least that's what I hope Cornerstone would be doing. If, the time, if, if society really fell apart, I think we'd still be reaching out to people with the gospel and saying, you can still repent. You can still give your life to God. You don't have to die this way. You don't have to suffer this way. God is just. And you are suffering justly, by the way. It's easy to read this and feel sorry for people, but only God can bring perfect justice in such a way that the, the punishment matches the crime. If it was a human being killing a third of mankind, well, then we start to think of Hitler and Stalin, and uh, then we think of unjust, right? But this is justice. This is different. And yet, I still think the people of God will be reaching out with the love of Christ. At least I, I hope so until there's absolutely no hope. One second here, I'm, I'm a little lost. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Okay, yeah, I'll end with this. I, I mentioned this once before, and in a, in a sermon some time ago. And, um, but I think it's really important for us to, to remember this, which is that Satan, you know, and never mind even the passage we just talked about or the book of Revelation, but just in our lives, in, in, in your life, as Christians, it is not the case, or, or we shouldn't think about life as a battle between Satan and God. There is no actual battle between Satan and God. I mean, there's, there's evil in the world that we have brought into the world by saying to God, we would like to be our own gods. We'd like to be our own masters. We'd like to be in charge. We don't want what you're selling. And that brings evil into the world. That brings a perversion of our desires, a perversion of our will. It brings death and sin and all these things into the world. But you can't actually have a war against God because he created all things. Is that, is that making make sense? And in our own lives, one of the dangers, I think, of spending a lot of time in the book of Revelation, I mean, I'm enjoying this. I, I hope it's clear. I, I, I'm learning so much by preaching through it. But there is a danger we start to think like there's a, a, a struggle between Satan and God that's, that's somehow equal, or not even necessarily equal, but even like 10% versus 90%. And it's just not the case. Everything Satan does is in God's will. Now, I want to be very careful with where I'm going here with this because sin is always a terrible and awful thing. But the whole of creation, it's all folded into the book of Revelation. The reason the book of Revelation is gospel, which is to say good news, is because it's how sin and evil and darkness and death are all destroyed and how they kind of destroy themselves. Does that make sense? And so it's sort of a self-defeating prophecy, as it were, that Satan tries to rise up against God and tries to take us with him. And how that works out with our free will, don't even get me started. I don't know. It's all very complicated. But there isn't an actual, if you give your life to the Lord, all you have to do as far as evil goes is to resist evil, right? Resist evil and Satan will flee from you and the devil will flee from you. You don't have to fight a battle in the sense of, of, of uh, you know, we, we'd, be, we'd be helpless before demons. Demons have power, real power. I mean, I, I believe that. But God is in control of all of it. All you have to do is be sealed in God's kingdom, sealed by his mark. And so if you give your life to Christ, there is no battle for you. You're going to have your own things. You're going to have your internal struggles, and you're going to have your victories and, and losses. But you are saved, and that's why it's good news. You don't have to fight a battle, and the battle's already won, which we sing sometimes. Amen? Okay. So I wanted to end with that. Well, we'll go to communion. Um, would you pray with me? Lord, it is a, a difficult thing uh, to read about your judgment. 
is a difficult thing to read about death and disease being poured out upon this earth. But Lord, we trust you and we trust your judgment. And Lord, we are so grateful that at the end of all this, heaven and earth will become one. And that there will be no more death and no more dying. That there'll be no more sin, no more darkness, no more murder. All these things that Karen read about this morning in her Sunday psalm, those things will be part of a past, an ancient past, and that you will wipe away every tear from our eye. Lord, we repent of the sins we commit, but we thank you, Lord, that even before we commit them, that we are found in grace, that we are found in you. And Lord, as we go to the table, we remember that this cost you something that you too suffered on the cross, that you suffered in our place. As we take the wine and eat the bread, Lord, may we remember what it cost you and be grateful yet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, for those who are visiting, we have a communion table over here and a communion table in the back. And if you're in a relationship with the Lord, uh, we do invite you to the table.